Um, I have a great guest for us today. Um, he's very popular at the co at conferences, many conferences. Um, he's a uh, somebody many look to for advice and counsel. He runs a website called the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report, uh, gloomboomdoom.com. He uh, precisely called the bottom uh, for the Dow and S&P 500 in 2009, and uh, literally to the day, calling the bull market. So a lot of people see him as, as Dr. Doom because some of his forecasts are uh, very, very uh, bearish, but he, he's not a perma bear. Um, he, he, he does invest in bull markets all across the world. And uh, he is a Swiss investment advisor. Of course, our guest today is Mark Faber. Mark, thanks for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very much. Well, Mark, before we get into uh, economics and the stock market, I just got to ask you, uh, what's up? Is anything, uh, anything new going on in life? Well, as you know, I've been labeled uh, by the mainstream media as a racist. I don't think that this corresponds at all with the reality. I wrote a report and I wrote about capitalism and socialism and about uh, private property and property rights. And I also wrote about uh, the tendency nowadays to want to erase history. In other words, uh, in the U.S., they're trying to tear down statues of people who 150 years ago had a slightly different view than uh, other people had at the time and defended essentially the South. They also tried to tear down statues of Columbus, which historically is one of the great uh, or most important personalities because he dared to sail to the U.S., to the Americas, uh, which was at that time uh, unknown, an unknown and dangerous voyage. And so I believe if you have a civilization and if you have culture, you should remember your past. Our past, the white man, has certainly not been glorious. It's been very cruel. We went to Latin America, the conquistadores, and they really wiped out entire populations and abused the system and their cultures. And we also had the area, uh, the era of uh, colonialism and imperialism. These were not glorious periods in our history, they were very cruel, but the fact is that uh, the white man, the Europeans, when they came to America, especially in the 18th and 19th century, they brought a lot of skills and knowledge and uh, work ethics, and they built a very prosperous society that is until very recently. And I think to try to deny the fact that the Western uh, white man made America great is just not right. And for that reason, I was attacked very badly. Well, do you think that it's because, do you think it has any, first of all, anything to do with skin color? Because I think that's what the politically correct and speech police get crazy when you say white could it be just that, that it was culture versus culture, right? Like European culture, is it more about culture than skin color, right? Uh, it is about, to some extent, a culture. I think in Europe, uh, during the age of Reformation, but already before, uh, it's not just a religious thing. The idea of capitalism and uh, work ethics and punctuality developed. And so that helped, uh, say, advance society. There's no question that I hate the term the Industrial Revolution because it started long because before the 19th century. But basically, over the last 200 years, we had uh, numerous important inventions that came mostly out of Europe and the U.S. 
And uh, nowadays we have more inventions essentially that come, or increasingly inventions that come out of Asia. But the point is uh, to kind of uh, dismiss the white man as bad, I simply cannot accept. Sure. No, I, I remember just being in vacation a few months ago in Turks and Caicos, and they were giving us a tour. And they were basically saying that uh, prior to the Europeans coming, uh, along with African-Americans or Africans, um, you know, like there would be uh, cannibals and crazy stories about uh, the, the type of tribes that were on those islands uh, prior to them getting there. I mean, it's not as if uh, the Native Americans were sitting there just uh, singing Kumbaya. But uh, I wanted to ask you about these statues. Uh, you had mentioned the Confederate ones. Even though in the north they uh, still kept, th uh, they had three slave states, or excuse me, four slave states, including the District of Columbia during the Civil War. Um, but there's other statues like FDR, for example, who in, who imprisoned Japanese people, um, delayed habeas corpus, confiscated people's gold. Um, there, you know, who, what, what, what is your feeling on on this response? Because the response seems to be pretty. Um, hysterical over our history at this point. Is this just a, is just is this a sign of a society that is perhaps in either a collapse or some sort stage of a uh, reset? It's a very strange situation, and I don't know where it will lead to. But very clearly, uh, I wrote actually my report in the context of. Uh, Twelve years ago, the whole world uh, being up in arms about the, the Taliban destroying uh, some very important Buddha statues in uh, uh, Afghanistan. These were very old Buddha statues, uh, some of the largest in the world, uh, and they were carved in rock. And the Taliban destroyed them partly. Now the thing is, the whole world was up in arms about this at the time. But equally they want to destroy their own monument. So that I don't quite understand the rational. Mark, um, it, it just one question, just because the critics are going to say that the, the reason that Africa has it so hard is because of the whites. So is that also, a... okay. Okay, so just to clear the air with opinions or facts, what what can you name off some, some either uh, black cities in the United States or black countries that are, you know, not hell holes? <laughs> Well, I think Botswana is doing reasonably well, but it's a very small country. And it has a uh, huge resource wealth. And uh, we probably had uh, some flourishing cultures in Africa maybe five, six hundred years ago. And uh, nowadays, uh, some countries are probably going to come back. So I'm not saying that Africa is lost forever, but the fact is that America was populated by white men, men that brought along technology, science, and skills, and that they were going to America to look for freedom. <clears throat> Mark, uh, let's move on to the the economy. Um, you you have you've had some big calls where you nailed them. The, of course, the big one, the biggest being in March of 2009, calling the bottom uh, for the Dow and S&P 500. You have been calling for a crash, but that call has not gone so well if you consider the last few years here. Um, why? Why? Why do you see a crash coming? Not why do you see a crash coming? Because I think most people listening would, would see a, a why a crash would coming. But let me ask you this. Why do you think it hasn't happened? Well, I think, and uh, to my credit about this, uh, I wrote already early on, maybe in 2000, 2003, that uh, money printing lifts asset prices in nominal terms. 
So if you look at the periods of high inflation, say Germany during the hyperinflation year, 1918 to 1923, you look at Latin American countries between 1978 and 1988, uh, in particular Mexico, uh, there was widespread money printing. What uh, then happened is that the currency collapsed. Uh, at the time, the dollar was a strong currency. The, the, uh, their currencies collapsed. But stocks went through the roof in nominal terms. Occasionally, they also went up in real terms. But in general, from, say, 78 to 1988, in dollar terms, Mexican stocks were more or less flat. But in local currency, they went up maybe a thousand times. And I realized, uh, and it took me a while to realize that, but, uh, and I lost a lot of money in the late 1990s because we were in the NASDAQ bubble. <laughs> the NASDAQ kept on going up. And I was short the stock market. But uh, in th then I realized, okay, if you print money, it's a bad thing to short financial assets. At some point, bonds will be a good short. But for sure, stocks, if you keep on printing, money go up. Now, <laughs> unlike in Mexico and Latin America, which printed money in the period 78 to 1988. Unlike that period, when other currencies were stable because they didn't print money in the U.S., they didn't print money in Japan, so the Latin American currencies all collapsed against the dollar and against other currencies. Now you have all central banks in concert printing money. So the paper money doesn't necessarily collapse against each other. It just collapses over time uh, against some hard assets. So between 99 and today, as you know, gold has gone up a lot from less than $300, to be precise, $255 in 99, to currently around $1,300. And then we had in gold also correction. This is just when you print money, you know, the money flows from one thing into another. So more recently, everything has collapsed in value against cryptocurrencies. So to call a crash is very difficult. The only thing I can say is the whole money printing exercise that then leads to an uh, increase in global debt. That will end badly, but I don't know, tomorrow maybe the central banks can keep on printing money for another 10 years. They can also uh, essentially have paperless money or have a negative interest rate as they have actually in Europe. And so the whole thing can last for quite some time. I'm not short stocks. I'm negative about the world because I know it will end badly. But it's very dangerous to be actually short an index because in this environment of money printing, it can go much higher. Well, it's, it's, yeah. So it, it, when, it, when it comes down to it, Mark, would you rather own the S&P 500 uh, or let's say a stock like Apple or, you know, uh, dollars or any fiat currency? Won't the fiat? Won't the stock market well, just hit a new? Very good question because you ask in a normal environment, and there's no clearly normal environment, uh, and there hasn't been for a long time. But say in a relatively normal environment, uh, people have choices to have their savings in cash, uh, which are bank deposits, treasury bills, and so forth. They can also invest in bonds, uh, short-term bonds, one year, to up to 30-year bonds. They are slightly more risky, but they also have a higher return 
historically than cash. And then you can also choose stocks. They are more volatile, obviously, than cash and bonds. But in the long run, they have higher returns than bonds or cash. But in today's environment, so I could say cash is the safest. But in today's environment, uh, I recommend everyone don't put all your money in cash because you're taking a huge risk in an environment of a depreciating purchasing power uh, by having cash. So when the purchasing power of money depreciates, it means that every year with your cash, you will be able to buy less goods and less assets than in the past. Now, can it be that in one year, you know, cash is the best investment because uh, computer prices drop? Yes. But at the same time, if I look at uh, what cash was worse in the 80s and 90s and what it is worse now, then I have to say that people who never owned any shares and bonds and real estate and collectibles and art, they lost out meaningfully. So I would have a diversification. I don't know how it will end. I don't think it will end well. And maybe uh, we will all end up poor, but I prefer to have some money in equities and have some money in cash and bonds and some money in precious metals and uh, some money in real estate. Uh, with the cryptos right now, are you also putting some money in the cryptocurrency space? I don't because I'm not an expert on cryptocurrencies. I think this blockchain technology is here to stay. But quite frankly, I have no idea whether bitcoins will be worth one day $100,000, as some people say or a million dollars, as some people say, or whether they'll be worth much less than they are worth today. That I don't know. Some people I know, they think it will go up substantially. These are relatively sophisticated investors and also technology people. Uh, they are very optimistic. But as I said, I don't quite understand it. Now, I you could tell me, well, Mark, why don't you just put 10% of your money in bitcoins? Yeah, I can, uh, you know, understand that some people would do that. I don't think I will do it because uh, nowadays the volatility is that high and also bitcoins and cryptocurrencies in general, they uh, display some symptoms of a bubble. Now, can the bubble become much bigger? Yes. But they have symptoms of a bubble. Well, I mean, it, they have symptoms of a bubble, but do, do, wouldn't, wouldn't the uh, internet or dot-com stocks have symptoms of a bubble, say, in 1995, six, seven years before they imploded? Yes. Uh, certainly in 97, 98. That's why I just explained to you uh, I believe that uh, some investors uh, who say that bitcoins will go to ten thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, maybe they're right. I just don't know. I think sometimes in the world of investment, you have to accept the fact that you don't know, and so I prefer not to invest in cryptocurrencies. But as I said, maybe they'll go up a lot. Mark, I want to talk to you about uh, your thoughts on what's happening with the Trump administration, as well as uh, get into perhaps some specific investment ideas that you might have right now or trends that you're seeing. So let's start off with uh, President Trump. Uh, you know, he, he, he's doing a lot when it comes to rolling back regulations. And certainly he uh, he understands the, 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 the power of suggestion. Uh, but. When it comes to Congress, it's 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 the big things are not getting done. the The border wall is not getting done. The tax cuts aren't getting done. The repeal of Obamacare is not getting getting done. What are your uh, what are your what are your thoughts right now on uh, the Trump administration and uh, 
their uh, goal to uh, turn the country around economically? Well, again, uh, this is a very controversial question because some people say, well, he's doing great things. And others think that he's a moron, uh, including someone in the administration. But <laughs> my sense is it's probably better to have him than, say, Hillary Clinton. Uh, concerning Congress, does he get uh, things done there? Uh, the problem is he, his idea was that he could just go into the administration and so called, uh, so called drain the swamp. But the swamp is so huge, <laughs> you know, you, not even Hercules could clean it and dry it up. So this is a huge challenge. Plus, uh, I think that uh, where I'm somewhat disappointed is he vowed before becoming president to essentially change the administration and he badly criticized Wall Street. What is in domestic policies in the administration? Mostly Wall Street people, certainly on the financial side. And uh, then on foreign policy, he had vowed to essentially withdraw from some countries like uh, Afghanistan and so forth. What does he do? The military runs uh, foreign policy, basically, which may not be all that bad because the generals may be quite responsible. <laughs>